Okay, so this uh, should be the second lecture. Uh, and here we are going to spend some time uh, on the main meat of what was your first year linear algebra class. And I'm going to go over some of those notions here. So I will start with linear systems and matrices. So I'll start with a linear system. So a linear system, if you recall, uh, first year algebra uh, is a system of this form. So it's a set of equations. Uh, so here I have written down M equations and you can see this M here because the index of this A here is M. Uh, so here I have M equations and I have N unknowns and this is reflected in the indices of the X's. So you can see the X's go to N. And so this is called a linear system and you spent a lot of time uh, in first year linear algebra uh, going over uh, this type of system, trying to understand uh, how they work, what they represent and so on. So here uh, the unknowns, uh, so that's the x's, uh, the coefficients of the unknowns, so the aij's and the uh, right hand side uh, here uh, could be in R or C. Uh, many, many times we'll be you assuming they're in R, but nothing forbids you from having a system uh, of uh, where some components are in C. Uh, and of course, uh, solving a linear system such as uh, the linear system one here uh, means that what you want to do is to find the values of x1 to xn that satisfy all the equations simultaneously. And so you spent a lot of time in first year learning how to manipulate those systems and etc. Uh, but I remind you that the main result here, and let me point out in passing that important theorems will appear like in red as compared to blue. Uh, so this was one of the main theorems uh, you saw about linear systems is that a system such as the one on the previous slide can have either no solution, a unique solution, or infinitely many solutions. So this was an important part of your course. Remember, you cannot have just two solutions. You have either zero, one, or infinitely many. Okay, and this corresponds to, it's probably the easiest to remember about this is if you think about a linear system with two equations and two unknowns, which will re represent two lines in uh, the plane, uh, these two lines can either be parallel, in which case there's no solution, they can intersect, uh, in which case there's a unique solution, and they can overlap completely, in which case there's infinitely many solutions. Okay. Now, uh, on linear systems, what you learned in uh, linear algebra was uh, a variety of operations, but which essentially boiled down to what is called Gaussian elimination or Gauss-Jordan elimination. So Gaussian elimination was when you performed elementary row operations to try to bring the system in a form that uh, had uh, leading ones and a variety of other things elsewhere. And Gauss-Jordan meant you went further and tried to have only leading ones uh, and no, uh, no columns above a leading one uh, having other non-zero entries. And so these were the row echelon form and the reduced row echelon form of a system. So I'm not going to go over this at all. Um, I encourage you to turn back to your lectures. We might need this from time to time, in which case uh, I will remind you of this. Now, the important thing is that at some point during your first year algebra class, uh, there was a move towards uh, using linear systems with matrices. And so this was done by taking the previous linear system that I had a few slides ago and writing it in the form uh, below AX equals B, uh, where A was what we called an N by N matrix. X and B were column 
typically vectors. Uh, and so instead of writing the system as we did here, we can in this form write it in this very compact and uh, convenient form uh, here. Now, I'll make a few remarks just before we proceed. Uh, typically, uh, in math, we assume that vectors are column vectors. Uh, and so we think of them as being uh, vertical. And so we'll typically write x this way with a, in a vertical form or with a transpose operator at the end. Uh, and I'll come back to transposition uh, later. Now, uh, one remark uh, before we go any further uh, is that a special type of linear system is the one that arises when the B term here on the right is actually the zero vector. In this case, we say the system is homogeneous, uh, so it's a homogeneous linear system, and the solution x equals zero is always there. Uh, so that means that when you're considering the alternatives uh, in the theorem that we saw above, uh, the case of no solution is never present because x equals zero is always solution to this problem and therefore uh, the system always has at least one solution so it can have one or infinitely many solutions. Okay, now I want to spend a little time detailing uh, what we could call matrix arithmetic. Uh, but before I do so, let me uh, make a brief remark. So I'm, I'm segmenting uh, these recordings because I'm hoping that from time to time, instead of uh, showing you these slides, uh, I will be able to uh, work out a few examples. So I don't know yet exactly how I'm going to do this. I'm working out solutions, but that means that uh, if it's a little jagged the way things come out, it's that I've cut at a paragraph uh, and then I've uh, pasted together uh, various videos that I made. Uh, the intent being that between videos or with slides like this, I might throw in a few examples uh, where I'm writing either on a board or on a piece of paper. I have yet to find uh, precisely how to do this in a good way. Okay, so this being said, uh, the previous uh, section we were looking at uh, the link between linear system and matrices, and so now the, most of what we are going to do in this course is going to involve matrices themselves. We are not going to look at linear systems so much as matrices and their properties and how to uh, use them. Uh, it will be linked, of course, with linear systems, but that won't be the only thing. So now for a little bit on matrix arithmetic. So um, to start again, uh, but making the definition uh, clear this time, uh, first, what's a matrix? A matrix is an M by N uh, rectangular array of elements of R or C, and it has M rows and N columns. Uh, so the notation is as I indicate here. I'll typically use uh, just a standard letter, a capital letter for matrices. This indicates that these are the entries in the matrix, AIJ here, uh, is simply it's saying the entries of A are the little a uh, sub ij, and this is the general form of the matrix. Um, it's simply uh, this uh, collection. Now, I'll remind you that we always list matrix indices first with rows and then columns. So here you can see that I'm listing entries uh, A11, so this is first row, first column, a1n here is first row nth column. Uh, here, this is a m1, so mth row first column. And this one here is a m n, so mth row nth column. Um, we're going to always use this notation here. Uh, so a curly n with indices m and n to indicate uh, 
the size of a matrix. Okay, this means uh, when I write M sub MN, I mean a matrix of size MN. Uh, and if it's not needed, I won't indicate whether we're working in R or C. Um, so typically what we're going to have is this notation here uh, to say a non-square matrix of size with M rows and N columns. Uh, and typically uh, when the number of rows equals the number of columns, we say the matrix is square and we omit things and we'll just, just write M sub N. Okay. So when you see a single index with the M, I'm talking about a square matrix. If you see two, I'm talking about a non-square matrix. Now for the basic arithmetic, I'm not going to spend a long, a long time on that. Uh, so if I have two matrices A and B, uh, most operations require the matrices to be of the same size. So you can see that here I'm assuming M, A and B are both uh, M times N matrices. Uh, and I'm going to take a scalar, so um, which I'm going to take in F, okay, R or C. Um, scalar multiplication then is simply the operation which multiplies each entry in the matrix by the scalar C. Addition of two matrices consists in addition of all the entries in the matrix, uh, the corresponding ent entries in both matrices. So the 1, 1 entry in A plus the 1, 1 entry in B, the 2, 1 entry in A plus the 2, 1 entry in B, and so on and so forth. Subtraction is just the addition of minus 1 times the matrix you want to subtract. Okay, and minus 1 times the matrix is simply scalar multiplication of the matrix by minus one. So that means that if I'm doing A minus B, this is equivalent to saying A plus minus one times B, which is the same as taking AIJ, so the entry in A and adding minus one times the entry in J and B, sorry, and this is simply this uh, difference here. Uh, and finally, there's a very important operation also on matrices, which is transposition. So if I have a matrix A of size MN, the transpose of A is the matrix of size NM. So I'm flipping rows and columns. Uh, and simply where the entries in the transpose matrix AT are the entries AJI. So what are rows in A become columns in, B, in A transpose, and what are columns in A become row in A transpose. Now, the other type of um, operation that you've seen on matrices is multiplication. So the matrix product, if you remember, this is the, uh, the first complicated thing you run into. Uh, the matrix product requires what we could call the inner dimensions to match. So the number of columns in the left matrix must equal the number of rows in the right matrix. So suppose I have a matrix that's A that's in MN and a matrix B that's in NP, then my result takes the outer dimensions. So the matrix AB is uh, of dimension MP, uh, and the entries uh, in that result matrix, let's call them C, the entries are simply the sum of the product of entries taken in a row of A and a column of B. If you remember, you can sort of go down like this and sum and etc. Now, one very important thing to remember is that the matrix product is not commutative. Okay, this means that in general, I mean, there can be times when it's true, but in general, if you have two matrices that you can uh, multiply both ways, so typically that's square matrices, uh, you are not going to find that multiplying A by B is the same thing as multiplying B by A. Okay. Uh, Two types of matrices uh, that are very important are the zero and the identity matrices. So the zero matrix is simply a matrix that has only zeros. 
Uh, often we won't put the indices, but if, it, if it's important to understand what size we're dealing with, we'll write it this way. So with a zero and then the index M and N of a number of rows and columns. The identity matrix, on the other hand, is a square matrix, so it cannot be uh, like this one. It's a square matrix. Uh, typically, we'll write it as IN unless it's clear what N is. And the identity matrix, I remind you, has ones on the main diagonal and zeros everywhere else. Uh, now, another type of matrix that's very useful and that we'll meet over and over again are symmetric matrices. So we say that a matrix is symmetric if the entries match uh, above and below the diagonal. A very easy way to characterize symmetricity of a matrix is by looking at this equality here. So a matrix is symmetric if it equals its transpose. Okay. Now, uh, what's very nice with symmetric matrices, and this is something that we will use very soon in the course, actually, uh, is that if you take a matrix A, square matrix, uh, then if you add the matrix N, its transpose, you get a symmetric matrix. If you have a non-square matrix, then you can make symmetric matrices by simply taking the product of A times A transpose and A transpose A. Both of those products are square matrices and furthermore, they're symmetric. Okay, and let me very briefly go over this because it sort of illustrates the way we do uh, some uh, reasoning sometimes in uh, matrix uh, analysis, matrix theory. Uh, so, the property that I'm trying to establish here is that some matrix is symmetric. And from what I just said in the previous uh, slide, a matrix is symmetric if it equals its transpose. So if I'm looking at a matrix X and I want to show that it's symmetric, well, it's equivalent to say that X is symmetric to saying that X is equal to its transpose. So what I want to do is when I state that, for example, this matrix is symmetric, all I want to do is to use for X a matrix whose symmetricity, let's say, I want to check. So here I'm going to say this matrix is symmetric if this is true, okay? X, here I'm going to use X equals A plus A transpose and XT, A plus A transpose, transpose. Okay, I'm simply replacing X here by A plus A transpose. And when I look at this A plus A transpose transpose, what do I get? So I get that this is the transpose of A plus the transpose of a transpose of A. So this is A transpose, of course, and the transpose of a transpose of A is simply A, okay? Remember, we said we flipped rows and columns. So the first time I transpose, I have my rows, for example, I make them my columns, and then I transpose again, my rows become, uh, my columns become the same rows again, okay? So this is A plus A transpose, We're, because matrix addition is commutative, okay? So I can write A transpose plus A to be A plus A transpose. And therefore here, what I'm reading is that A plus A transpose is equal to A, uh, transpose, sorry, is equal to A plus A transpose. So I'm done. The same way, if I want to show that A times A transpose is symmetric matrix, well, all I need to do is now replace my X here by A, A transpose. So what that reads, A, A transpose equals A, A transpose transpose. Now, one property that uh, I'll remind you of and I'll remind you again uh, later on in these notes is that when you take the transpose of a product, you obtain the product of the transposes, but in the reverted order. Remember I said matrix uh, multiplication is not commutative, so it's important to remember what order you're taking things in. 
and when you are multiplying, uh, sorry, when you're transposing a multiply, uh, multiplication, uh, you get multiplication of the transposes, but with the order flipped. So when I take the transpose of this product, what I get is this matrix transposed times this matrix transposed. So this is a, a, a transpose transpose times a transpose. So this is simply a that first term, and the second one is a, a transpose. And of course, the other one works the same way. Okay. Next uh, thing I want to go over is uh, determinants. So I remind you that determinants, uh, if I have a matrix A, uh, I need to fix this in the notes. Uh, if I have a matrix A, uh, then the determinant, and I'm supposing the size is at least two, then the determinant of A is the scalar det of A, which we sometimes write with uh, just vertical bars. If it's clear that A is a matrix, we just put vertical bars. Uh, and this is the sum, uh, so this is what we would call the cofactor expansion along row i. So if I'm doing this, then what I'm doing is I'm taking the sum for j, so that's the columns, uh, going from 1 to n, uh, and I'm uh, multiplying, uh, so for each term in the sum, I'm taking a i j, times Cij, where Cij is the cofactor. And you will recall from your first year uh, algebra class that you did a lot of computations to compute these determinants. Um, the cofactor is uh, simply this minus one times i plus j times the determinant of the submatrix of A in which you've taken away the i row and j column. And I really recommend that you try a few uh, just to remind yourself what this is uh, doing. We could also fix the uh, vary the, G, the i here, and that would be uh, cofactor expansion uh, along a column instead of a row as we did here. And I'll remind you that what's happening when you use this formula is that you get a, what's called a recursive formula. So if I apply it to a matrix of size n, let's say 4 by 4, uh, I am going to compute these expansion, uh, these cofactors and these uh, uh, sums for all the sub-matrices for four matrices of, type of size 3 by 3. And then to compute the determinant of those three by three matrices, in turn, I'm going to take three cofactor expansions of two by two matrices. And when I get to the two by two matrix, I can then use this formula that you have here at the bottom, uh, which simply says that the determinant of a two by two matrix is simply the product uh, of entries along the main diagonal minus the product of entries along what we could call the anti-diagonal, okay, so on the other uh, axis, a21 times a12. Now, um, determinants are very important, we'll come back to them many times in the course, uh, so that's why I think it's important to uh, practice a, a bit uh, with them from time to time. Um, one type of matrix in particular that we'll see, uh, one general class of matrix that we'll see uh, from time to time, and this is a very important result that um, is going to be handy uh, from time to time in, in our course. So that's why I, I highlight it. So uh, we call upper triangular matrix a matrix, a square matrix uh, that has only non zero entries above and on the main diagonal. The other way to characterize this, the proper way to characterize it, is to say that all the entries below, strictly below the main diagonal, are zero, which we can write this way. A i j is zero whenever my row is larger than my column, so if I'm below the main diagonal. And the matrix is lower triangular if all the entries above the main diagonal are zero which this time means that a i j is zero whenever the j is larger than 
Vi. Okay. A matrix that's either lower triangular or upper triangular is called a triangular matrix in general, without making it clear what they are. And a matrix that is both upper and lower triangular, that means it has zero entries above and below the main diagonal. And that's a matrix we call diagonal. Okay. Typically, uh, in advanced courses like this one, if I have to uh, deal with a diagonal matrix, I will write it this way here. Often, instead of writing the matrix itself and pointing out that some of those entries are zero, I'm going to um, just write diag with the non-zero entries. Okay. And what's really important as a result to remember is the following, that if you have a triangular or a diagonal matrix, then its determinant is simply the product of the entries along the main diagonal. Okay, so it's very easy to compute the determinant of a triangular or a diagonal matrix. And that's going to come in handy several times in what we do. Now, another notion uh, that is uh, very important in matrix arithmetic is the inversion. Uh, so the definition of inversion uh, goes as follows. Uh, a matrix, uh, here again I have issues with this, I will need to fix, uh, but okay, the slides posted would be different. Uh, so a matrix A is invertible, and we also say non-singular. Uh, if there is a matrix that we are going to write right away as A inverse, uh, A minus one. Okay, if there is such a matrix of the same size, which is such that A times A inverse is equal to A inverse times A, it's equal to identity. And we say A inverse is the inverse of A. Okay. If A inverse does not exist, then A is singular. That's another name for, um, for uh, a matrix that's uh, not inverted. Um, and uh, very important properties uh, to look at are that if I have a matrix and I have two vectors, then A is invertible if and only if, okay, this is equivalent to saying that the determinant of A is non-zero. So one very simple way to check invertibility is to check what the determinant is. Uh, A is invertible means A, is, A inverse is unique. So there's a unique matrix that will satisfy this, which in passing means that if, for instance, you're trying to use this formula to check that a matrix is invertible, you don't need to check both of those equalities, provided you find an A inverse such that A, A inverse is equal to identity, or A inverse A is equal to identity, then you're done, because that matrix A inverse will be unique. And finally, another result which ties in back with a linear systems is that a matrix A is invertible. If, if sorry, if a matrix A is invertible, then the linear system AX equals B has the unique solution X equals A inverse B. And that is one of the reasons why we like to consider invertibility. So in view of this, uh, we can revisit matrix arithmetic. And I, I really want to stress this. Um, with the addition, subtraction, scale multiplication, multiplication, transposition, and inversion that we have seen, you can do arithmetic on matrices essentially as if they were scalar uh, quantities. Okay, so the things you're using, you're used to doing in algebra, but in lower algebra or in calculus or whatever, when you're solving equations, you can do the same with matrices, but you have to remember several things. First of all, the sizes must be compatible. So if I'm adding things, things must be of the same size. If I'm trying to invert, then I need a square matrix, etc. Okay, the order in which you present things is very important because matrix multiplication, I'll drive it in, is not commutative. 
Okay, so writing AB is not the same as writing BA. Whereas with scalars, if I write two times three, it's the same as writing three times two. But for matrices, this is not true. So you have to be very careful with this. And the last one uh, that I'll point out is the one that I mentioned a little earlier, uh, that transposition and inversion change the order of the products and they change them in the same way. So if I compute the product AB transpose, uh, transpose of a product, sorry, uh, then what I have is the product of the transposes but with the order flipped. And the same is true for inversion. So if you have invertible matrices A and B, uh, then the inverse of AB is B inverse times A inverse. Now, if you use these rules uh, and you remember to do this uh, properly, that things go in a certain order and so on, then you can do exactly the type of thing that you're used to doing with scalars, okay? Another thing that I want to uh, give you a brief reminder about is diagonalization. So you may or may not have seen this. The program varies a little bit from time to time. Typically it's, for example, in 1300, this is at the very end of the course and it happens that it's not covered. Uh, we will see examples, okay? I will give some, uh, some extra material perhaps so that you can uh, go over this quickly if you need to. Um, the first part in diagonalization is to think about uh, eigenvalues, eigenvectors, and eigenpairs. Uh, and this is central uh, to any uh, matrix theory uh, class, and we are going to look at eigenvalues, eigenvectors very, very frequently uh, in a variety of applications. Okay, and this is also it's prevalent in all fields of science. Uh, eigenvalues, eigenvectors are really, really important. Now, what is a, uh, an eigenvalue, eigenvector? So let's start this way. So um, take a square matrix. So here we're talking square matrices, not uh, arbitrary matrices. We say that a vector X that's either in R or C uh, that is non-zero, and this is really important, so it is not the zero vector with only zeros. It can have zeros, but it cannot have only zeros. So a non-zero vector x is an eigenvector of a matrix A. If there is a number lambda, and that the number, so a scalar, that can be in R or in C, and that number is called an eigenvalue, if, so we have an eigenvalue and eigenvector, if the following relationship is satisfied, a times x equals lambda x. And throughout the course, when I mention eigenvalues, we'll come back to some of uh, what that means. But for now, just take this equation as given. Um, and so if you find a non-zero x and a lambda, but are such that this equation holds true, then we say that lambda and x are an eigenpair. Okay, they're a corresponding eigenvector. We also say that, for example, lambda is an eigenvalue and x it's, is its corresponding eigenvector or vice versa. Okay. One remark is that if you have uh, an eigenpair, lambda x, then for any non-zero value of C, a scalar, uh, lambda C times X is also an eigenpair. And this is very easy to see, okay? If I compute A times CX, C here is a scalar, so I can move it around in the product, okay? A is a matrix, X is a vector, so I can't change their order, but C is a scalar, so I can move it where I want. So A times CX is C times AX. And AX, because lambda X is an eigenpair, AX is equal to lambda X. So I can replace AX here by lambda X. So that means that what I have is that A times CX is C times lambda X. Or CAX equals to C lambda X, it doesn't really matter. 
And because C is non zero, I can divide both sides by C, okay? Again, because this is a scalar. Uh, so I'm multiplying both sides by one over C, if you want. And what that means is that AX equals lambda X. So again, CX is uh, an eigenvalue, uh, um, uh, sorry, an eigenvector. So that's important, and we'll come back to this uh, later, but this is important because it means that once you have an eigenvector, all vectors that are in the same direction, or actually in the opposite direction, are also eigenvectors corresponding to the same eigenvalue. Okay, so eigenvectors give you a direction more than an actual value. Okay, and this is something we'll see later. Uh, in diagonalization, the next uh, concept that comes around is similarity. Uh, similarity is uh, something that you've probably barely seen, but again, as I said, they, this is more to give you a framework uh, that you can go back to when we are going over things later in the course. Okay? But, so similarity is defined in the following way. So if I have two square matrices, A and B, of the same size, uh, I am going to say that A and B are similar, and we are going to indicate this this way with the, uh, the little tilde here. Uh, we say A is similar to B. If there is a matrix P uh, of the same size, that's invertible. Okay? It doesn't say anything here about invertibility of A and B, but the matrix P here needs to be invertible. So if I can find a matrix P such that P inverse, sorry, P inverse AP is equal to B, then I say that A and B are similar. And for some of you who continue in math, you will see uh, later that this is what is called an equivalence relation. So if I take three matrices A, B, and C, then the first thing is that A is similar to A. Okay, uh, it's easy. What matrix am I going to use to do this? Identity, because identity inverse is still identity. So if I multiply A, by identity inverse times A times identity, what do I get? I get A. So A is uh, equivalent to itself. So that's, we say uh, the equivalence relation is reflective. The similarity is reflective. Now, it's also what we call symmetric because if A is similar to B, then B is similar to A. And finally, it's transitive. Uh, because if A is similar to B and B is similar to C, then A is similar to C. Okay. Uh, why is similarity uh, useful? It is super useful, I should point out. Uh, is that, okay, suppose I have two matrices that are similar to each other. So A is similar to B. Uh, then the matrices have the same determinant. Uh, what that means in particular is that, you know, that the, the matrix is invertible if and only if its determinant is non-zero, for instance. Uh, well, that means that if A is invertible and B is similar to A, then B is invertible. And another very interesting property is that if A and B are, sim uh, are similar, then they have the same eigenvalues. Okay, so this is quite important. And why is this? Uh, used here? Well, it is because diagonalization uh, does this. So uh, what we try to do is essentially when we have a matrix, uh, we try to write it in a form that's simple. Okay, this is something that you will see often in this course. We're going to take matrices and we're going to look for ways to make them simpler to use, essentially. And diagonalization is a very good way of making things simple. So that's the definition. So we say a matrix A is diagonalizable. If I can find a matrix D that's diagonal, such that A is similar to D. Okay, so if you want to characterize in, in, in mathematics, I mean, in another way, uh, what this means is that A is diagonalizable, uh, diagonalizable sorry, if there is a diagonal matrix D and a non-singular matrix P, such that P inverse AP, 
is equal to d. So let me remark quickly, and uh, this will become clear very soon, uh, that we could, of course, because p is an invertible matrix, we could also write it th that equation this way. Instead of writing p inverse a p, we could write p a p inverse. Okay. Nothing forbids us from doing this. Matrix P is invertible. Uh, it's going to change a little bit things, but not much. But the thing is that if you're using P inverse AP, computations are much easier. And I'll come back to this in a, in a second. Now, do we know how often things are diagonalizable? It's not as simple as this, okay? So uh, there's a theorem which is an important theorem, uh, it says that a matrix A, a square matrix A, is diagonalizable if and only if it has n linearly independent eigenvectors. And I'm going to come back to linear independence in just a short while, okay? But before I do so, uh, let me uh, sort of point out, I know the last time I taught 1300, uh, I couldn't quite touch linear independence uh, because we moved things around in the program. But the next theorem here, the corollary that you have here, uh, this one is one that I, I taught to my students. So and this is a sufficient condition for diagonalizability. Okay, so this, if you recall the lecture about logic, this means that uh, I have if some property holds, then the property that I'm trying to show does hold. And this is uh, one easy way to find a diagonalizable matrix. So if my matrix has all its eigenvalues distinct, so when I'm computing eigenvalues, I have all my eigenvalues having different values. Okay. In that case, A is automatically diagonalizable. So in a way, what this means is that in this previous uh, theorem here, uh, we are in this case where the fact that all the eigenvalues are distinct means that we have n linearly independent eigenvectors. And because of that, we can follow this arrow here towards the left and get diagonalizability. Okay. And now that remark I made earlier about uh, the order in which you present P inverse and P uh, comes into play, okay? So if I have, uh, if I want to diagonalize the matrix, what I do is in the matrix P, I'm going to put the linearly independent eigenvectors as the columns. Then I'm going to invert P if need be. Uh, and uh, then this operation in this direction, P inverse AP, will give me the matrix D in which the eigenvalues corresponding to the linearly independent eigenvectors are in the same order. So if, for example, my first eigenvalue is 1 and it has a, an eigenvector V1, then in D, 1 is going to be at the topmost position if I put v1 as my leftmost column in p okay and that's why it's useful to write things in this way okay the penultimate topic i want to talk about uh in this review is something that is probably not a review for most of you okay and again uh the reason why this is not quite a review is that this will probably be handy for us later, uh, but I want to put it here now because I think it's part of first year algebra more so than it is uh, second year algebra. It's just a quirk of the program. Uh, that means that you haven't seen it. Um, and this is uh, a little bit of consideration on linear independence. And this is going to take us on to bases and dimension. And these are very important topics uh, to understand what you're doing. Uh, we're not going to go into much, much detail. I'm not going to ask you to know those results very well or anything like this, but you sh I, I think they really help to understand 
some of the notions. Okay. Uh, so the first thing I want to uh, look at is linear combination and span. So a linear combination, and this is very, very important. I should stress, I mean, this is a, um, this we will use. Um, so if I take a vector space, and remember we, we are working in the simplest case where the vector space is typically a vector space over the reals or the complex numbers. Uh, but this could be true of anything. And I'll point out later that, for example, matrix uh, uh, matrices form vector spaces as well, okay? And so we'll come back to that. But, okay, for now, think of vector spaces just over R or C. Uh, so a linear combination takes a set of vectors. So here I'm, I'm using V1 to Vk. Um, and I'm multiplying each vector in this set by some constant, uh, where these constants are in R or C. And so this here is simply a constant, so a scalar, times the first vector, plus a scalar times the second vector, plus a scalar, etc. Uh, this is a vector. Okay, this is not a number, it's a vector, it's a new vector, and it's called a linear combination of the vectors. The span of a set of vectors, okay, so if I take, say, a set of vectors in a vector space, uh, so vectors v1 to vk, the span of that set is the set of all linear combinations, <laughs> linear combinations of those vectors, okay? So the span of the set v1 to vk is the set of all c1 v1 plus c2 v2 plus so on and so forth ck vk for all c1 ck belonging to f, okay? So this gives us a lot of combination of the vectors. And let me just uh, come back to something we saw earlier, uh, which I should be able to find uh, here at some point. Yes, here. So here I'm writing the vector V as a linear combination of the standard basis vectors. So over here I'm in R3, okay? Uh, and I'm using all linear com well, I'm, I'm writing here a linear combination of the three standard basis vectors. And what is the span of these three vectors? Well, it's all the linear combinations of i, j, and k like this. And that's the entirety of R3. Okay, because I can take, for example, 1, 1, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, 0, a third, whatever. I can vary everywhere. And so the span of i, j, k is R cubed. Okay. So let me go back to uh, my slide here. Okay, so that's what we call the span. It's the set that is covered by all linear combination of a set of vectors. Um, and that's very important. Okay, so a very small result, don't worry about that one too much. The span of a set of vectors, that's going to be the smallest subspace of the space you're working in that contains all the vectors. Um, what's really important is uh, what follows. So if the span of my set of vectors is the vector space itself. So in the example I was looking at before, the span of i, j, k was R three. So in that case, we say that that set of vectors spans the vector space. Okay. And in terms of vector spaces, we have two types. If, as in the case I was de just detailing, uh, I have a set of vectors that spans my vector space. I say that my vector space is finite dimensional. If I can't find a set of vectors that spans this, 
then uh, we have an infinite dimensional vector space. Okay. We are going to work only with uh, finite dimensional vector spaces. But it's important to understand where things are coming from. Okay. Now, the important notion I was uh, referring to earlier and that we saw, for example, in diagonalizability is linear independence. So take a set of vectors v1 to vk in a vector space v. We say that that set of vectors is linearly independent if the only way to get the zero vector when you take a linear combination of the, those vectors v1 to vk is for all the scalars that you're using for the linear combination to be zero. Okay. So that's how we define linear, linear independence. Okay. So the set is linearly independent if the only way to make uh, things equal to zero is uh, for all the coefficients to be zero. If that is not the case, then we say that the vectors, uh, that, that set is linearly dependent. And let me just point out because that really helps understand what's happening. So suppose that I have a linearly dependent set. Then I can assume uh, without loss of generality, just in passing, this is something you see uh, a lot in math, Suppose uh, there is a non-zero C somewhere, uh, and without loss of generality, let me suppose that it's actually C1 uh, that is non-zero. Then what happens is that I can take this equation here and solve it for V1, because I can simply write that V1 in that case is equal to minus c2 over v, uh, c1 times v2 minus and so on and so forth minus ck over c1 times vk. So that means that I can express v1 as a linear combination of the other vectors in the set. Okay. If I can't do this, then I have linear independence. Now, Suppose that I have a finite dimensional vector space. As I said, we'll only deal with finite dimensional. Then the number of elements, and this is called the cardinal, uh, but the number of elements in every linearly independent set of vectors is going to be less than or equal to the number of elements in the spanning sets of vectors. So let's come back to our three because that's uh, the easiest space to work on. Um, if I take so ijk, uh, as we saw before, that was a spanning set for R3 because I could make all points in R3 by using these linear combinations of these three uh, standard basis vectors. Now, if I add one vector, if I take ijk and something else, then automatically what that theorem tells you is that it is sure that one of those vectors will be a linear combination of the others because I have more uh, elements uh, there. Okay. And this links to the next concept, which is uh, basis. And this is very important. And once again, this is not critical uh, to understanding what we're going to do, but it, it sort of gets you a sense of what is space uh, in a way. Um, so if I have a vector space, I call basis of that vector space a set of vectors that is both linearly independent and spanning. So that means it's vectors of which none are linear combinations of the other. And also, it's vectors that cover the entire space. The span of that set of vectors is the entire space, and none of the vectors are linearly dependent. That's what we call a basis. And whether it is in algebra, but also in calculus, some of you will be doing multivariable calculus, for instance. Uh, you will see a lot of things about the geometry of things. 
where a basis is a way to describe all the objects in space, essentially. Okay, and then if you have, uh, uh, sorry, uh, a, a criteria, I mean, so if you want to characterize a basis, so what we call a criterion for a basis is something that you can use to characterize a basis, because what I have before is a definition, and now I'm looking for ways to, to identify something that makes up a basis. So if I have a set of vectors, if you want to VK in a vector space, then that set of vector is a basis if and only if whatever vector V I take in a vector space, I can write it uniquely in the form of a linear combination of the vectors in a vector space. Okay, go back to the example of um, or three, uh, IJK is a basis of R three because any vector that I take in R three, I can take, uh, I can represent as a linear combination of IJK, and that is a very simple linear combination. I just have to take, suppose I have the point one, two, three. I just have to multiply I by one, add two times J plus three times K. And that gives me that vector. Any vector that I take in R three, I can represent as a linear combination of the vectors i j k. Okay. Now here's a theorem that uh, we used to show uh, in first year algebra that we uh, some of you might have seen, but not all of you. Um, and uh, let me just very briefly explain what this means. Uh, so this is called the plus minus theorem. Um, so suppose I take a non-empty set of vectors in a vector space. Uh, if I have a set, where, sorry, if my set S is linearly independent and I can find a vector V in the vector space that is not in the span of this set, then I can add this vector. So this is what this first thing says here, okay? I can add this vector to the set of vectors. So suppose I have v1 to vk, this is a new v. So now I will have v1 to vk, comma, v. That new set is going to be linearly independent. Okay, but it has to be a v that is not already in the span. And in the same way, if I have a vector that's in my set of vectors, and it's a linear combination of vec other vectors already in that set, then I can reduce S in a way and keep the same span. So if I have a vector that's linear combination, uh, well, let's go back to our three. So let me take uh, I, J, and K, and uh, the vector one, one, one. The vector 1, 1, 1 is a linear combination of i, j, and k. It's simply i plus j plus k. That vector is a linear combination. So the span of the set i, j, k, 1, 1, 1 is the same of the, as the span of the set i, j, k. So I can remove this, uh, this vector from the list. Okay, so that's where the plus and minus uh, name comes from. I can add and I can remove depending on what I have. And uh, so for basis, what that means is, I'm not going to go into detail, but if you have a finite dimensional vector space, then every single time you can find a basis. It's sometimes not easy, but you can find a basis. And Another thing, and this is where we t touch the notion of dimension. If I have, if I take two different bases of the same finite dimensional vector space, they are going to contain the same number of vectors. Okay, something that is a, a basis of a vector space needs the same number of vectors. And that's what we call the dimension. So, 
you've seen this, but you haven't really seen it. But that's why I wanted to talk about it a little bit, to show you where this is coming from. Uh, so when we talk about some space that has dimension 10, for example, what we mean is that a basis of that space requires 10 vectors and 10 vectors only. Okay. Just in passing, uh, when I take a subspace of a vector space, uh, then that dimension is going, uh, the dimension of the subspace is going to be smaller than the dimension of the space itself. Simple example, all three again. If I take the plane that's in the, uh, so uh, let's call it x, y, z space this time. If I take the x, y plane, it goes through zero. That's important because to be a subspace, you need to go through zero. It goes through zero, zero, zero. Uh, it's a plane. It's a subspace of R3. It's a two-dimensional subspace of R3 because the plane x, y is something that I can describe with two linearly independent vectors instead of three. Okay. Uh, almost the last thing. Uh, so to construct bases, uh, if I have a finite dimensional basis, uh, the vector space, sorry, then any linearly independent set of vectors in the vector space that has dimension of v elements is a basis. So if you, if you have a vector space, you know it's dimension three, let's say, and you find three linearly independent vectors, then this is a basis. Okay. And uh, the same way, if I have a finite dimensional vector space and I find a spanning set of vectors that has dimension of v elements, then again, this is a basis. Okay. Okay. That's it, I think, for revisions. Okay, the last uh, little reminder I want to give you is uh, something that is sort of summarized as linear algebra in a nutshell uh, in on a little uh, thing I had on my door uh, before they repainted, which I'll try to dig out. Um, so uh, the idea is uh, this little theorem that you saw, and uh, we're going to go over it uh, quickly. Uh, so this was a theorem that you probably saw in your first year lectures. Uh, it was given to you incrementally, uh, most likely. So that means uh, it started out with a few of those results and then we kept on adding results until it reached something that looks a little bit like this. Um, I'm going to be using this in an example that will come after uh, this. Uh, but uh, so this is what's called a TFAE uh, type result and TFAE stands for the following are equivalent, uh, which is short for the following statements are equivalent. So what that means, uh, and you'll see an application right away after this, um, uh, what this means is that uh, all of those statements are either true at the same time or false at the same time. Okay, so they're all equivalent, and therefore, if one is true, all are true, and if one is false, all are false. So the statement goes as follows. Take a square matrix A. Then it is equivalent to say that A is invertible, but for all vector Bs, Ax, plus, AX equals B sorry, has a unique solution, and that solution, just in passing, is X equals A inverse B, as we saw in the past. Um, but the only solution to Ax equals zero is the trivial solution x equals zero, but the reduced row echelon form of A is the identity matrix. One thing that I sort of briefly mentioned but didn't go into is that A can be written as a product of elementary matrices, which are the matrices that encode elementary row operations that you perform to go into Gauss-Jordan uh, elimination. Uh, another equivalent statement is that for all vector b's ax equals b has a solution. There is a matrix b such that ab equals identity, which means 
there is B is here the inverse. Okay? There is an invertible matrix B such that AB equals identity. Because recall that the inverse itself is invertible, of course, and it's equal to A. So those two statements are equivalent. The determinant of A is non-zero, which is probably one of the statements you use the most. Uh, and finally, zero is not an eigenvalue of A. This is something you might not have seen as much, but this is also a, a statement that's equivalent to saying that the matrix A is invertible or non-singular. Okay, so I seem to have found how to uh, work out exercises uh, on uh, my tablet uh, and uh, actually record this. So uh, I am going to uh, just show you briefly uh, the example that I mentioned in the reminder about uh, first year linear algebra, which was to compute the uh, eigenvalues of the matrix that I've written here. Uh, so uh remember that uh, to find eigenvalues in eigenvectors what we need is uh we seek lambda oops and x solution uh, with x non-zero and this is very very important remind remember that i i pointed this out with x non-zero uh, solution to ax equals lambda x and i'm just going to take a little time to uh, motivate uh, the way we do to find eigen uh, the way we use to find eigenvectors values sorry uh, just because i think it's important uh, and also it it illustrates a little bit uh, matrix al arithmetic okay so i i'm looking for an x and a lambda that satisfy this one way that i can write this also i can write that ax equals lambda x this is equivalent to so on the left, if you AX is a matrix, two by two matrix, X is a two by one vector. So this is a vector. On the right, you have lambda, which is a scalar, times X, which is a vector. So I have a vector on the left and a vector on the right. I'm allowed to bring them to the same side of the equation. Okay, AX minus lambda X equals zero. And now I want to factor things out. And the reason I'm allowed to do so, and be careful, I'm just going to point out a potential pitfall here. So this is equivalent to A minus lambda times identity times X equals zero. Why did I put identity in there? Well, if I don't, suppose you don't put identity. Suppose you write a minus lambda x equals zero you forget to put the identity why is this wrong well obviously this is a two by two and this is a one by one so this operation is not allowed okay so this is wrong um, but if you think about it i times x if I take I to be, uh, that's the identity matrix, okay? I times X. So I is a two by two and X is a two by one. So I times X is two by one, which is exactly what we want. And I times anything, provided that computation is allowed as it is here, uh, I times anything is anything. So I times X is X. So all I've done when I've used, so I'll be fancy and change colors. When I've written this here, uh, all I've done 
is make the sizes compatible, okay? I've simply used the fact that i times x is x. And so I've in fact written that this is ax minus lambda ix equals zero. And now I've exploited the fact that I've uh, the same vector on the right and therefore I've written a minus lambda i x equals zero. Okay. Uh, by the way, I uh, can export this and I will do so, but uh, remember that this is uh, not a very organized solution, so it will be good to uh, watch it together with the, uh, the video. Okay, so I am not, uh, remember, so we said we seek lambda and x, x non-zero, such that a, so now I'm writing it in the second form that we wrote, so a minus lambda i x is equal to zero. Uh, so, and to find lambda, we solve, we uh, seek again lambda solution to determinant of a minus lambda i equals zero. So what's the link between these two statements? If you recall your first year uh, linear algebra, you went from uh, uh, writing this ax equals lambda x equation to uh, being told you're looking for uh, lambdas that are solutions to determinant of a minus lambda i equals zero. Well, the reason is simple, and it boils down to that theorem we ended the uh, review session with, uh, which was that the following are equivalent. And I'm just going to write down the two that are of interest to us here. One of them is that, well, remember, it's, it all boils down to uh, the matrix is invertible. But the ones we're interested in here are that the system AX equals zero has only the trivial solution X equals zero. And the other one was that the determinant of A is non-zero. And recall that I discussed at length the fact that uh, all the statements are true or all the statements are false. So what I have here, I have another matrix. I'm looking at uh, my matrix is not A here. I have a matrix A minus lambda I. And I want that this equals zero for an X non-zero. And what I know from the above theorem is that a minus lambda x equals zero has only the trivial solution if determinant of a is non-zero. Okay, these are equivalent. Uh, so what we do is we take the negation. So ax equals zero has non-zero solutions if and only if determinant of a a minus lambda i here, that's the matrix we are considering, is zero. Okay, so we're taking the negation of these two statements. We're saying we have other solutions than x equals zero uh, because the determinant is actually zero. Okay, so now back to our uh, initial problem. So I remind you that we're looking at the matrix and as I pointed out on the first slide, uh, my writing is uh, very bad, uh, so these are my M's. Uh, sometimes I try to make them a bit more legible, but uh, when I'm writing quickly, I'll probably forget about it. So it's better to get used to the fact my, that my M's look weird. Uh, so I have this matrix M and I want the eigenvalues. Let's start with the eigenvalues. So eigenvalues 
lambda, let's call them one, two. I know there's going to be two. They might be the same. Okay, one, two. They might be the same, but uh, there's going to be two. Eigenvalues lambda one, two are solutions to determinant of m here minus lambda times identity equals zero. Okay, let's go, let's continue. So what's the determinant? Let, let me uh, use the vertical bar notation. So M is the matrix zero minus one, one, zero. Lambda times identity is this. I'm using the vertical bars to say uh, this is a determinant. Okay, so I'm looking for, uh, let me compute uh, the elements here. So I have here, I have a minus lambda, minus one, one, minus lambda. And this is equal to zero, if and only if. So the determinant of uh, this matrix here is lambda squared minus minus one, so plus one equals zero. And here you can see that we are going to get a complex uh, root because this is equivalent to lambda squared is equal to minus one. So if you're only looking for real roots, you're not going to find one. But on the other hand, if you're looking for a complex root, well, lambda squared is equal to minus one. Uh, this means that lambda is equal to plus or minus I. Okay. And these are uh, so lambda, uh, so the eigenvalues are complex. Okay.